It, what I later realized was a tremendously bad briefing. I was told that if anything were to go wrong, they didn't know what would happen to me, because nobody had ever come back to tell them. They didn't tell me there were seven prison camps along the Yalu River. They said they didn't know. I still admire the Americans, but they lied to me. Squadron leader, Andy McKenzie. Andy McKenzie spent two years in a Chinese prison, and his surprises were not over. In prison, McKenzie had met an American by the name of Fisher, who was in his own squadron. Fisher revealed to McKenzie that he had been shot down by another American pilot. McKenzie had chased a Chinese fighter to the Yalu River, and when he was rejoining the squadron, the American wingman had mistakenly taken him for the enemy. After I was released from prison, I learned that the guy returned from that mission and went right in and told our commander what had happened. The pilot was a religious person, and apparently he felt terrible. He asked to be taken off operations. They put him ferrying planes from Japan to Korea. Anyway, seven days after he had shot me down, he died when his plane crashed into a mountain in Japan. Apparently, he was preoccupied. After I finally got home, I was called in by some of our brass and told to keep quiet. We're friends with the Americans, and talking about this will only make them look sillier than they are. Why don't you forget the whole thing? Andy McKenzie dutifully forgot about it for 30 years. In June 1951, the Princess Patricias were withdrawn from the 27th Commonwealth Brigade and joined the 25th Brigade under Canadian command. At the same time, a Commonwealth Division was created. On June 2nd, the Princess Patricias established a bridgehead over the Imjin River. They were relieved by the Royal 22nd, Van Dues, under Lieutenant Colonel J.A. Dextras. About this time, the Canadians had their first sight of Korean refugees. Families and often whole villages were on the move, fleeing southward from the encroaching tide of battle, which had already passed over them twice. Poverty got to me, especially the hungry kids. We started to share our rations with kids along the road and give cigarettes to the older people. The country was so poor. Sam Woo Kim, now Sam Woo Soon Im, a Zen master with a temple in Toronto, was eight years old when the war began. He was nine when his mother lost her life. When the communists were advancing uh, to capture the city, so a whole village got caught in the crossfire. It was terrifying. I was uh, nine years old. When my mother died, I was taken to her grave. They were telling me, she's gone, she's dead. But I didn't cry or anything like that because I was very difficult to believe. I thought that the adults were lying to me. She could not be dead. So I thought the, they were hiding her somewhere and I just was telling me that she was dead. So I waited until dark and then went around looking for her, but she couldn't find her. And so I took train to go to Busan. So there I got stuck in Busan and uh, I didn't eat for three days. So I was really hungry and then I overcame all my kind of sense of propriety and then I started begging. So I ended up becoming a street kid. Many families were displaced and disrupted. There, was a, there were a lot of street kids and uh, they would do anything to make a living. So yeah, instead of having them running around on the streets, then they would uh, put them together and so that like a group home and provide uh, some kind of moral education or guidelines or teach them how to read and write. Sam Woo Kim had been taught to read and write by his mother who was a teacher. This became his salvation when at the age of 10 he was given the job of teaching the other children. When the Canadians arrived at Seoul, they found the city of more than a million people 
devastated. The war has cost a million lives, mostly the lives of civilians. There are three and a half million refugees, and there's the greatest destruction any country has ever seen in any war. One of the first tasks of the United Nations forces was to distribute aid to civilians. Many of the Canadian soldiers found themselves personally touched by their destitution. One was a future chief of staff of the Canadian Army, Colonel Dextrous of the Van Dues. Reconnoitering a demolished village one day, I came across a mother lying dead in the daybreak, with a baby still suckling on her cold breast. I picked up the baby and was immediately attacked from hiding by an older brother of six or seven. My signalers subdued the boy, and as there was no other life in the village, we took both of them with us in an armored car, giving the baby to the medical officer, who gave it to the padre, who in turn found a place for it in an orphanage. The boy stayed on with me for months. I had shirts and army pants cut down to fit him, and became quite attached to the little fellow. Eventually, I was able to place him in an orphanage, and he was educated. Many of our men had similar stories. Lieutenant Colonel J.A. Dextrous, the Royal 22nd Regiment. Well, in this communist prison camp, the treatment was rotten. I'm only exposed to everything that they've done. They're beating me, starving my buddies to death, not giving them any clothes, any medical treatment. Later on, 1951, they started putting out good treatment in order to get the men to come to their side and to denounce their government and work for their own benefit for the Chinese communists. They wanted me to admit that I had been in Chinese airspace when I was shot down. They wanted me to tell them I had been ordered to fly over China, and that I had been captured in China. This was what they called the truth. Finally, they wore me down to the point that I gave them what they wanted. I just couldn't take any more. A number of us were ultimately forced to do the same thing. Squadron leader, Andy McKenzie. Prisoners of the Chinese and the North Koreans were housed in bare-walled huts, slept on dirt floors, subsisted on thin soups of rice and turnips until their bodies were like matchsticks. They were also subjected to a wide variety of brutality and tortures. Neither China nor North Korea were signatories to the Geneva Convention, which set rules for the humane treatment of war prisoners who were housed like barnyard animals, but not as well fed. All of this could be counted as normal. What was not normal was a new torture that became widely referred to as brainwashing, a new weapon of war. The already deprived prisoners were questioned, threatened, and harassed for endless hours, pressured to make confessions of their errors and condemnations of their own leaders in film statements which were released around the world. One such was Canadian squadron leader Andy McKenzie, shot down near the Chinese border. He was taken into China illegally and put into a prison in Mukden. It was there that the Chinese took those who proved hardest to crack. I was sure I was gonna be killed. They kept hinting this, but they never actually came out and said it. After another period in solitary, I started screaming, and when the guard unlocked the door, I ran. I was covered in body lice, great big half-inch body lice, a million of them on my body and I was going crazy. I just couldn't take it anymore. It's what they hint they're gonna do. That's what drives you crazy. The torture was all mental. Being alone for days on end, I heard sounds that were not there. The loneliness was terrible. My body ached, but my mind kept on working, wondering what was coming next, and what they would do with my body after it was over, that sort of thing. Then I went on long, protracted crying jags. I cried for days and couldn't stop. Squadron leader. Andy McKenzie. The Canadian prisoners were forced to listen to indoctrination lectures and read communist books and newspapers. Promises of lenient treatment were made to prisoners who would sign peace petitions, broadcast propaganda, or help convert other prisoners to communism. Many did sign peace petitions in the hope that this would disclose their presence in the camps to relatives back home. 
32 Canadian soldiers.